This week on Thinking Biblically, we go back to Israel and we hear a story of how a Jewish young person from Montreal came to know Yeshua as his Messiah, basically on his own. Welcome back to Thinking Biblically. My name is Alan Gilman. Thinking Biblically is a podcast dedicated to exploring how all scripture speaks to all of life. And one of the ways we do that is through the special guests that we, we bring on the podcast. And before I introduce this week's guest, I do want to remind everyone to uh, subscribe and to share, like, and review. And so it is my, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, my friend, Alan Wiseman. Alan is a Montreal Canadian born Israeli who came to know Yeshua, Jesus as his Messiah in 1966. Alan is an architect and Bible teacher, having received his architectural, architectural, did I say that right? Architectural degree from McGill University and both his master's and PhD degrees in philosophy from the University of Waterloo. He's been a lecturer at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia, as well as a researcher and teaching assistant there. Alan has been involved as a leader and teacher in several congregations in Israel and has a particular passion for apologetics in an Israeli context. Alan's wife, Nahama, was born in Israel, but spent a good portion of her youth in Canada, where she met Alan. They've been married for almost 53 years, both that's a mazel tov and a baruch Hashem, which means praise be to the name for his faithfulness to you and Nahama all these years. Israel has been their home for the last 26 years. They have two sons and three grandchildren. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to see you, Alan, and uh, hope you'll uh, ask me some uh, pertinent questions here. Yeah, it's just it, it's such a it's such a joy to have you and and to have a bit of an excuse to see you. You know, we met. I figure we first met in the uh, it, it was uh, the late eighties or early nineteen nineties. Uh, you were in town. I can't remember if you were in Israel at the time or if you were somewhere else in, in, in Canada, but you were visiting Montreal. We were back living there for about four years at that time, and we met at a restaurant. That's the very first time. And not knowing that we would get to see each other through the years, uh, uh, we were living on the West Coast, and you were there for a while, and then we moved to the Ottawa area, and then you were in Southern Ontario for a while, and we got to see each other. And then a few years ago, Rob and I had our first personal trip. I've been there on tours a couple of times. We had our first personal trip um, just before COVID, and uh, we got to stay with, with you and, and your family, and that was also such a joy. Um, people might remember, too, that your son Nathaniel was uh, took part in our, our Passover Seder, our virtual Seder, and he, he sang for us, and that was wonderful. I mean, we can't wait to get back out there, but for now, um, it's good that we can uh, do, do this. So um, you came to the Lord about 10 years before I did, same city, different circumstances. So how would you like to share uh, your background? Could you share a little bit of your, your family background, religious background, and what eventually led you to the Lord? Sure. <clears throat> Well, um, I was born in Montreal in 1947, which was quite a while ago. And uh, I come from uh, two parents. My father's side uh, came before the First World War to Montreal. And my father was born there in 1914, uh, the eve of the First World War. And uh, my mother, she is from uh, Poland and she came to Canada before the Second World War in the early 30s. So uh, that's my particular background. And uh, both my parents are pretty much from a conservative Jewish background. And uh, so uh, we attended synagogue, of course, on the high holy days and at times also on Shabbat when I would go with my father to the synagogue. So that's a very quick uh, little intro. I can say uh, that. Uh, as you know, uh, most of the Jewish population lived within a larger milieu of uh, French-speaking Canadians, aside from the English-speaking group that was in Montreal. But uh, I grew up throughout my uh, youth and also into high school in mostly in the middle of the Jewish population. And the uh, 
rare thing was to have a non-Jewish person in class. There were maybe five out of the 30 or 35 there were uh, that were not Jewish. So uh, it was pretty unusual for me to uh, uh, have relationships in a, in a sensible or healthy way with uh, non-Jewish people. And uh, in fact, there was a lot of tension often uh, where we lived with uh, uh, some of the uh, French speaking people who were sometimes anti-Semitic. So I have a history <laughs> with that as well. So you grew up in fundamentally Jewish neighborhoods. Um, That's right. <clears throat> you, you attended synagogue, but not very religious, would you say? Um, not that religious. My father uh, was being trained to become a rabbi, but eventually stopped doing that for all kinds of reasons. But uh, we would often go to the synagogue, especially the High Holy Days, where I would sit with him through uh, the service, even as a young child. And then later on, a uh, number of years before my bar mitzvah, I would uh, you know, go to Jewish school. So uh, background was uh, generally um, more Jewish than you'd have, let's say, in uh, the United States with the Reformed Jews, but not as uh, <clears throat> you know, religious as the Orthodox. Okay, and then, so what led, how did you first hear about Yeshua and what are the circumstances that led you to faith? Well, after my bar mitzvah, I uh, essentially stopped uh, a lot of my interest in uh, the Bible, uh, which was pretty minimal at that point, other than having to study for the bar mitzvah. And uh, of course, going to Jewish school, I was familiar with a lot of the uh, historical figures of the Bible and the basic stories. But uh, with science and uh, the future developing, um, I was more interested in the future and uh, what uh, we'd be able to do as humans in developing uh, things on Earth, uh, certainly solving problems. So uh, it was of a greater interest to me. Uh, now, I should mention as well that growing up, uh, I was familiar with uh, the Jewish struggle throughout history, and especially difficult were the uh, pictures I would see in the yearbooks that we had at home of the Holocaust. So that's one of the uh, indelible memories that I carried with me. So it was always us versus them, us being the good people, the Jewish people, and them being the Gentiles who persecuted us. So other than this uh, historical reality and sense that I was Jewish, uh, it didn't translate into something that that was because of God, but rather uh, some, for some reason that we were being uh, you know, hated. And uh, so that was the, the issue. But uh, science and the future was really my cup of tea. And that's basically how I conducted myself. And uh, I became a great uh, science fiction buff. Yeah, so uh, those are the kinds of things that I was looking forward to. What decade are we in? Because a lot of people say, think of science fiction. We've got yeah. Star Wars and, 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 and some yeah, of This is before Star, Star Wars. This is the early 1960s. So. Oh, so Star Trek. Were you into Star Trek? Uh, eventually, but uh, I kind of found it... Uh, uh, less interesting sometimes than uh, actually reading the, the science fiction books. So I was into all kinds of people like Asimov and Heinlein and a whole bunch of other authors. I once had my picture taken with Ray Bradbury. Wow, that's something. It is. <laughs> so uh, I was interested in, you know, uh, how science would solve all human problems and uh, so that, that was, you know, what are the possibilities out there that humans might achieve? Did you have uh, thoughts of grandeur of what you were going to do? Like, were you going to make science fiction real? Uh, not really. I was, you know, still in one sense, still a child. And the other, you know, trying to understand uh, what I was about and what interested me. But uh, uh, my... Uh, I guess genetic inheritance is um, partly artistic from both my father and mother's side. So uh, I was 
interested in drawing and painting and stuff like that. Um, just develop. Um, so did the architecture come before your encounter of, of faith in God or did they coincide? What happened? It, it kind of coincided. Um, let's just go back a little bit. Uh, in Montreal, you had various levels of finishing high school. So most of us finished the uh, grade 11 and then uh, went for university. And uh, this was... Uh, 1964, when I graduated from uh, North Mount High, and uh, I was not the greatest student in the world. I was, you know, more into imagination and all kinds of stuff like that rather than applying myself to studies. Uh, so uh, graduating was, you know, for me a struggle, <clears throat> and uh, I uh, had to plug away at it to kind of memorize and. Uh, do my best to, to finish uh, as best I could. And uh, so I was kind of concerned, you know, here, uh, what am I gonna do in life? Finally, now that I've graduated, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna even be able to get into university. So that was a question. And of course, 1964 was the time of the Vietnam War raging. And uh, it, of course, uh, was a major question that suddenly cropped up because here we were uh, thinking that, you know, the Second World War was the height of human cruelty and folly. Uh, so many people dying. And now that we had atomic weapons, which, uh, you know, were a threat to all humanity, uh, the more technology we uh, picked up and gained, the more dangerous life would be on Earth. So it was a puzzling thing that uh, something like the Vietnam War would be raging at a time when people ought to have known better because the future didn't look very bright. Uh, the more that we advanced on one hand, uh, the more barbaric we became. So uh, this was a very difficult thing that I'm considering, well, if that's the case, uh, what's the future for me going to be like? And what do I want to do? Where am I going to fit in? So that was uh, the summer in which I'm uh, basically starting to ask myself all kinds of serious questions and what uh, the future is going to be like. So uh, I'm thinking that, you know, if we don't kill ourselves off, then eventually we're going to be solving all kinds of problems on Earth, like poverty, uh, weather, disasters. Other issues like uh, health will solve all the sicknesses eventually. <clears throat> we'll even live incredibly long lives because we'll be able to grow our own organs and replace them. Uh, so, uh, you know, like, if we can overcome our uh, folly and, and violence, then uh, the future is essentially unstoppable. So, uh, Eventually, I got my entrance into the university, which was, of course, uh, interesting and uh, happy for me that uh, I made it. And uh, so at that point, I'm thinking, you know, what is it that I can do? So not being so great in physics, uh, but more in the arts, <clears throat> I figured that I'd be better off uh, doing something like architecture. So that's the direction I took. Yeah, so it's interesting. Some of the things that you've been saying, like the uh, having to deal with this almost a sense of despair because you know the 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 doomsday clock was getting closer and closer to midnight in in those days, um, and yet at the same time that that human a common human reaction to get incredibly optimistic it seemed that you were you were dealing with with that tension. Um, <laughs> and so, um, what was it in, and forgive me if you've told me the story before, and I don't have those notes in front of me, but was it in university that you started hearing about Jesus for the first time and God and what okay, happened? I need to go back a little bit again, I skipped over some stuff. Um, here I am, you know, in grade 10 and 11, of course, uh, you know interested in all kinds of stuff. So uh, <clears throat> in Montreal, there was this program on the radio called Ask the Pastor. 
you probably remember that. And uh, the funny thing about it was that uh, most of the questioners that really asked pointed uh, questions were the Jewish people. And they would ask, of course, you know, how can, uh, uh, you know, Christians uh, be so loving to Jewish people when our history with uh, Christianity is one of bloodshed and terror? Uh, how can you defend uh, your Christian faith? And he would say all kinds of things, namely that uh, these couldn't be genuine Christians for the most part, because uh, the Bible spoke of love and love your enemies, even regardless, even Jewish people who were innocent for the most part in uh, these kinds of situations. So uh, all kinds of questions were posed that he had to answer uh, very delicately sometimes. Uh, but it, it was, for me, it was kind of a laugh as well. I was just listening in because I had to study and get ready for the coming week. So this was on a Sunday night. So, uh, you know, I'm asking myself, well, this is kind of silly anyway. You know, people still believe in God. And, you know, when all the world is moving away from these, you know, myths and uh, religious uh, stuff that's good for old grandmas and whatnot, but not for, you know, the future. So uh, it was kind of a joke for me just to, to keep my mind occupied while I'm trying to solve various equations or whatever. And so uh, the, the, uh, that was, you know, say grade 10 and uh, 11. But then after I finished, I started listening out of interest because I'm asking myself all these serious questions. So over the summer and then into the fall, uh, <clears throat> So what it was, it was kind of preparing me uh, for something. And let me give you a, a little bit of the story about how, how it actually uh, developed. Uh, so in this uh, train of thought, it was that, well, if we're going to be able to solve all human problems and uh, perhaps even live for extraordinary lengths of time, uh, It'd be kind of boring to have all the problems solved. So what's the next challenge that you have? Well, once you control the earth, well, you move over to the solar system. You know, it may take a number of years, but it's within human uh, feasibility. And if you don't kill yourself off, well, what's going to stop you from just the solar system? You might as well go on to the, the, the galaxy. And, you know, eventually, however long it's going to take, you're in control of that. And... Uh, well, there, what's going to stop you from there? It's just a question of time and the technology. And uh, you're able to essentially uh, keep moving out into the, the universe. And at some point in the far distant future, we'll be able to control the universe. And so the thought came, well, we'll be like God. And I said, huh? I gave up that idea. <laughs> what's this? But if we could become God, maybe, you know, it's not so crazy, you know, and that maybe God got there first or, you know, maybe it didn't happen that way. And so suddenly I was kind of in a state of, oh, my gosh, you know, it's like God's looking at me here. I mean, if we can do it, certainly God could do it, a greater intelligence, a greater power. So that kind of stopped me in my tracks. <clears throat> How old were you yeah. when, when you had that aha? Uh... That I was... Uh, I guess I was uh, just turned 17. Okay. So you're yeah. out of high school. Yeah. Yeah. For those 16, I, I was 16. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so even today in, in, in Quebec, high school ends grade 11. Yeah. And back in your day, you were able to jump right into university if, if you got accepted. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, kids in, in, uh, in Quebec got a head start that could finish university quicker than the rest of Canada. It's changed. Right. We won't get into those details right now, but that's what it was right. like. So uh, <clears throat> I wasn't, uh, you know, shocked and say, wow, I better, you know, look up the Bible. I've you know, neglected it for about three years now. Uh, and I didn't know where this little Bible was. So let me go back again. For grade 10, I think it was, we had to study the book of Job. Now, all the books in our little library were in Hebrew or Yiddish, uh, but nothing in English. So we didn't have an English Bible. So is that <clears> so in those Bible, days, are you you're talking about the Bible you got in, in public school, right? Yeah, we didn't Great get time. any Bible in public school. 
So the only Bible that I had was, you know, uh, the various books of the, the five books of Moses, which were mostly just in Hebrew, and perhaps sometimes they were in a bit of English, but it wasn't enough. I, ne I needed a whole Bible for the book of Job because I didn't have that, and I couldn't read Hebrew at that point properly. So uh, in those days, you could go to the corner store, which was not too far from where we lived, and I went into this little store that sold everything under the sun, and I asked them, I you know, didn't know, do you have a Bible? And he said, sure. And it has uh, the book of Job. Oh, yeah, that's the book of Job. So I bought this little blue Bible and uh, brought it home. And then uh, that was for the uh, studying the book of Job in high school. I think it was grade 10. So uh, promptly after that was done with, it, it disappeared into this bottom shelf of the library. And so now I'm looking. It's about a, a year and a half later or so. <clears throat> Where's that Bible? And I couldn't find it there on the, anywhere in there. And I stuck my hand on the bottom shelf behind the other books. And out it popped. And there it was. And so I'm now in the University of McGill. And so uh, it, in the, it's, you know, the early 60s, middle 60s. <clears throat> and what is uh, the issue there? Everybody is suddenly free from parental guidance. They're off to the new world of, you know, free love and all the rest that goes along with it. And drugs were coming in at that point. So, uh, you know, that was the scene at university. And so uh, now I open the Bible. And the first thing I find, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so, oh, wow, that's it. That's, that's the, the whole uh, story now. Now I'm getting information that I didn't, you know, recognize that was already there. I mean, I probably read it as a kid, but totally forgot about it. So here it was, boing, issue number one. Issue number two within two or three chapters. Oh, why don't you have a bite of this? It's not going to harm you. Everything's fine. Everything's good. You know, uh, have whatever you want. And so there it was, point number two that was, you know, at issue with me. And so it was like, Okay, I get it. This is what God is communicating as the truth. And so here I started or embarked on this journey of about a year and a half of uh, doing university studies, coming home, finishing whatever lessons I had to do. And then for the next hour or so, sometimes more, uh, reading the Bible pretty much systematically, although I skipped over all the historical books of the kings and whatnot because you know, I figured I knew all that stuff. So I went through uh, the first five books of Moses and then uh, skipped over into the prophets. And so that's uh, a journey then that uh, was sort of now my interest has peaked in what this pastor had to say on the radio. And so it was this kind of parallel uh, walk that I was trying to understand what God was saying. So that was just the beginning of a journey. Right, so you were, you embarked this basically on your own. I know we would say that God was involved, but yeah, you wouldn't have known that. Uh, you're basically on your own, and this Ask the Pastor program was simply people would call with their questions. Yeah, and uh, it was Pastor Johnson. That's uh, right. Yes, uh, very well known, and uh, and he would just graciously answer people's questions the best of his ability, and that's all you had. Yeah. Okay. Continue. So, uh, uh, here I'm reading, of course, it, uh, it's all interesting how God is interacting with the patriarchs. And of course, there's lots of stuff I don't quite get uh, God talking to the patriarchs and appearing to them in kind of strange ways and whatnot. Uh, but then what's uh, really caught my attention was in reading here, especially in uh, the revelation on Ma just before Mount Sinai, where God is, you know, talking to Moses and the children of Israel. Uh, you know, the thought, I believe, was here that uh, if God is so interested in having people know him, why doesn't he just appear, you know, to everybody around the world? And that's it. Everybody would believe. Here's God, you know, give a big show or whatever uh, appearance. 
And everybody's convinced like the Jewish people when God comes down on Mount Sinai. So it was that incident. Well, if God can do it for the Jewish people, he can do it for everybody. So why doesn't he do it? All right. So uh, that was, you know, it stopped me in my tracks again. So God used, uh, you know, my interest in science fiction. And then, you know, suddenly I had a Bible that was available that I had purchased earlier. And now I'm reading uh, about our history and, and these questions are popping up in my mind. So um, <clears throat> I said, well, okay, God, you know, you've done it for our people at least. So that's great. And then I was flabbergasted because it doesn't take very long that Moses is up in the mountain, right? And what's happening down on earth is that uh, there's a golden calf being constructed. And uh, I couldn't understand what's going on. If God had done such a spectacular, you know, revelation of his power and presence and, you know, conviction uh, pouring out uh, upon the people that they were so afraid that, you know, they didn't want to hear God speak. Uh, how is it possible that the Jewish people, after all the miracles that have already happened, uh, go back uh, to what they've learned in Egypt and building an idol? So I was, you know, I didn't know what to think at this point. And then it, I realized uh, there's something wrong with us as a people, if we can do that. And not only that, if we're representative of the best kinds of people, let's put it that way, at least that's the way I thought, uh, we are in a tragic state because it means that no matter what God does, we'll turn our back. And so, you know, I'm, you know, just in shock in, in this kind of situation. So that. Uh, arrested me and had me thinking. And it wasn't just them, you know, in the past, it's now me. So here I'm trying to now be a good Jew because I believe in God and the Bible, etc. And I'm bound as a Jew to keep all the commandments and do all the good things. But I recognize that I'm not able to do it. Even if I want to, I'm struggling with my own, you know, habits and whatnot, weaknesses. And, uh, you know, it's not just me, it's everybody. We're all in the same boat. So, okay, God is showing me all kinds of things here and then, you know, struggling with this. And this is now happening over months, uh, uh, a process of reading through scriptures. And then you're, I'm reading in Isaiah chapter, is it nine and six? Behold, a child is born, a son is given, his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David to order and establish the kingdom forever, etc., etc. And so I said, well, I never heard about this. For me, if this is the Messiah, uh, you know, I thought it was the nation of Israel that, you know, this was the, the final uh, outcome of all our history. So who's this person? You know, how can he have this kind of name or title? This, this doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, for Jewish people, you know, uh, you can't give a person this kind of a name. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Something doesn't fit here, right? <clears throat> so... Yeah, you know, I'm continuing to read here through Isaiah, and of course, you have uh, many passages saying, "I am God; there is no other. There's none beside me. I, I make alive, I kill, I do all all of this." So, you know, you can't have anybody else, and of course, that fit perfectly well with what I believe uh, that there is one God, and no human can possibly be God, and so you know. I have this struggle in my mind of trying to figure out what's what's being said. Uh, because I was a Jewish student in university, in those days, people could get probably lists of the students that had registered. So being a new student, uh, there was somebody that found out, you know, what's a Jewish looking name and somehow sent me a booklet on Isaiah 53. And uh, it was very interesting. 
I hadn't read Isaiah 53, so I read it through. I said, well, that's interesting, but, you know, I haven't gotten there yet. So I'll put this booklet aside and just continue reading in, in the Bible. So eventually I get to, you know, passage of Isaiah 53. And I said, interesting. Okay. I didn't know who this was about or whatever. Couldn't fit it in with any other passages at that point. And, uh, you know, just kept reading. Well, I went through all the prophets <clears throat> and listening, you know, on the radio still to this program out of greater interest all the time. Um, and at some point, <clears throat> I, I didn't know, but it had the New Testament in this Bible. And so, you know, I'm a curious guy. I know that we're not supposed to write, read the New Testament vaguely. But, uh, you know, it was there and, you know, there was no harm in, in looking at it. And, of course, it starts off with the generation uh, history of uh, the Messiah, or at least, the, you know, this person, Yeshua, Jesus. So uh, I wasn't uh, turned off because it looked like a very Jewish book. And the more I read in Matthew, et cetera, the more interesting it, it was uh, about. So <clears throat> here I'm reading this and, uh, you know. Uh, I probably read through the whole New Testament in a matter of, you know, a couple of months, maybe or less. And then, uh, uh, you know, still still couldn't make head or tail. But the, the issue was that, uh, you know, maybe he was, you know, a righteous uh, Jew. Maybe he was even a great teacher. And maybe he was even the greatest prophet of Israel. But God couldn't be. No man can be God. And so, you know, that's a closed door for most Jewish people. And certainly it was for me. And uh, <clears throat> so you, you have, on the one hand, the passages where God says, I am God, there is no other. And then you have these passages like uh, Isaiah 9, 6 and others that I had found that uh, pointed to this unusual figure of, uh, you know, a king. Uh, unusual king, and possibly, you know, someone who suffered for our people as well, although that was pretty vague in my mind. So uh, this is probably the, the second time I'm reading through the New Testament, and I'm reading in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 9. So the book of Romans, of course, uh, for your readers, is written by uh, Shaul, who is the Apostle Paul in his uh, Greek name. Uh, and he's writing to these believers in Rome. So it's called the book of Romans. But uh, I'm reading uh, this area where it's talking specifically about the Jewish people. Uh, <clears throat> and so it says, if you confess with your mouth Yeshua as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So here I am. <clears throat> okay, the light hits me and I say, oh, all right, trying to solve this problem. So I ask myself the question, is anything too hard for God, right? Uh, uh, could God raise someone from the dead? No, that's not a problem for God. You know, I created the universe, created humans. He can raise anybody he wants from the dead. And so could he have raised Yeshua from the dead? And so, yeah, and if I can believe it, uh, I would be saved. Now, what it meant to, for him to be Lord, I had no clue, right? But whatever it was that God included in the package, if I confessed him uh, that he raised Yeshua from the dead, uh, that was good enough for me. And so uh, it was this Sunday night, after listening to this uh, pastor program on the radio, I kind of whisper under my breath, uh, yes, Lord, I believe in uh, what you did in raising Yeshua from the dead and whatever Lord is, whatever it means, uh, I go along with it, something to that effect. And, you know, I'm whispering because I'm living at home and my parents are right next to, to my bedroom. So I didn't want anybody to hear. And so uh, uh, I go to bed and, um, you know, and you're in this half uh, quasi sleep state. I kind of had a vision of, you know, an answer to this prayer. So I knew like that, that uh, God had answered this prayer. So that was uh, the main part of 
that journey had reached a certain uh, point. Are you going to tell us some of what was in that vision? Um, well, it was, uh, I'm lying in bed and uh, my rib cage is kind of like iron. And then I see this light kind of coming down. I don't know what it was, a fire, a light. And uh, slowly my rib cage opens up like this and this fire or light comes in. And suddenly I'm absolutely awake. And I knew that this was the answer to uh, this prayer. And of course, on one hand, I thought I was totally crazy because I never had an experience like this before. And on the other hand, it was obviously, you know, something's going on here that I don't know anything about. So that's that was the experience. And then for the next week, I'm kind of in a different headspace totally. Um, I got to talk to somebody. If I go to the Jewish uh, club, they'll think I'm totally nuts. And so I know where not to go. That, that <laughs> so, would be the, the Jewish, where, you know, the Jewish yeah, club. So I didn't on, know where to go. Yeah. The Jewish club on campus, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So and were you doing drugs? Was, Maybe you've never I, told I, anybody. I never did any drugs. I maybe smoked a cigarette, you know, a little bit once, and that made me sick, and I gave it up real quick. So uh, other than, uh, you know, Shabbat wine or something like that, that was it. So uh, uh, it it, the whole week, I I just couldn't get up the courage to go anywhere to check with anybody. So uh, and apart and again. I, I, we've said it already. So you basically did this journey by yourself up to this point, except for yeah. listening to the to yeah. the Ask the Pastor so, program Sunday yeah. nights. So it was good background because it it cleared away some of the rubble that most Jewish people have concerning Christianity as a you know, institution. Oh, the radio program. The radio program did that. Real, real believers and how they're to conduct themselves. So it, it helped, you know, uh, set me on a healthy path. So uh, Shabbat shows up Saturday and I figure, well, I got to go around the neighborhood and look for some place. Uh, I'm not going to go to the synagogue. So I'll look around. Maybe there is some kind of fellowship or church or whatever. And not a Catholic one because I already knew what I didn't want to do. So uh, I got on my bike and started biking around. There was one little place on St. Catherine road or St. Catherine Boulevard. Where was, I can't even remember the streets anymore. Anywhere near the Jewish general. Uh, And uh, that's Coat St. Catherine. Coat St. Catherine. Catherine. Okay. Coat St. Catherine. Yeah. Okay. So it was a little far, far from my house. uh, So I figured not, I'll keep riding. So at that point they had the Carrie Boulevard already constructed. And so I went over the highway there and, uh, um, found a place nearby and uh, just on the other side of the, the car expressway. So uh, I come up to the door on the side and I'm trying the door. It's supposed to be open. It's Shabbat, you know, but what, Saturday. But what was what was this place? It, it, I didn't know what it was. It looked like a, a church, right? Oh, okay. So I'm trying the door on the side and it doesn't open. It's locked. So I, you know, maybe there's a sign or something around here. So I go around the bush that was on the other street, and oh, there's the sign. So what does it say? Sunday morning. So that's how much I knew, right? Uh, church services in uh, Christian circles are on Sunday, not on Saturday. Saturday is where you go to the synagogue and so forth. But Sunday, it was closed. Uh, Saturday uh, was closed at the church. So, okay, uh, tomorrow I, I'll, I'll come here. So that's what happened. So uh, the next day I show up at the service and after the, the pastor speaks, I talk to him and said, I liked what you said. I kind of accept the, you know, the same kind of things. And uh, so he says, uh, you know, if you're at university, why don't you come back tonight? They had services then in the evenings as well. Uh, and uh, you'll meet somebody who's there at the university. So that's how my uh, relationship with believers on campus began as well. So I went to that place uh, and also at university and the fellowship there. 
So there was some sort of <clears throat> campus group that was able to be able yeah. to connect with. Right. So I got involved in a lot of activities then for the next few years. So this was now my second year of university. And uh, so I got involved pretty quickly in the various activities there. And this is the first time, apart from the radio, you're actually interacting with other human beings on your faith journey. That's right. So how did how did you relate? Now I'm assuming is the group on campus they're they're non they're non Jews or were you meeting other Jewish people at that time? Were you the only one? No, at this, at this point it's all non Jews. So uh, university life was of course a shock because they're coming out of a mostly Jewish. Uh, background and uh, milieu by moving into a mostly Gentile milieu where Jews are the minority and not the majority. So yeah, that it was, of course, different. Very typical for Jewish people of that time. Yeah. It was the same for me. I'm every, Everything is 10 years later with me, uh, but the, the cultural dynamic is very, very similar. Yeah. So it was going into community college uh, called CJEP right. uh, after right. high school. It was the first time um, and, uh, and if we d often now, depending where you lived, um, the, the few non-Jews we would know at public school would be Protestants and right. it's only going into C. Jeopardy university. They're actually Catholic people, uh, uh, you know, Montreal, <clears throat> probably majority Catholic, but right. we tended not to mingle with, with Catholic people. Um, so now, okay, so now you have this new faith, you're um, connected with uh, this, this church fellowship and the, the club at school. How did, how did you deal with your own Jewishness and your new faith? And was it an issue or how did that work? Uh, with a lot of difficulty. Uh, so uh, although I, I had read uh, a lot of scripture at this point, and was familiar with a lot of the, you know, the teaching, I had a struggle still intellectually accepting the fact that Yeshua was God. Uh, so uh, it took about at least a year to have somewhat of a more settled understanding of Scripture and finding the actual references where uh, the patriarchs wrestled with God in various messianic passages, so it gave me uh, more or less confidence that I was, you know, on the right path and not some kind of crazy Jew. Uh, you know. So on the one hand, I thought like I was the only Jew since the days of the Apostle Paul that came to Yeshua. On the other was, you know, uh, at least there are the people around that can, you know, help. And then... Very soon afterwards, I was able to meet some other Jewish believers in Yeshua, some older ones as well that were working in Montreal. So I attended a Bible study or a few other activities that were run by either Jewish people or they spoke, uh, Messianic Jews spoke there. Yeah, so, so Alan, the issue that you've mentioned it more than once is the issue of uh, Yeshua, Jesus being God. Right. Right. When I came to know him, uh, he was presented as the Messiah. Right. He was our long-awaited Messiah. Right. It's, I don't know when I first even encountered the the issue, the controversy. And as you know, for a lot of, of well, Jewish people for sure, and Jewish believers in particular, his divinity has been a very difficult topic. Yes. For our non-Jewish, our non-Jewish non-Jewish believers almost take that for granted, but it's a big issue for, for yes. Jewish people, Jewish believers in particular. Um, that might be a topic you, maybe you can come back sometime, because I, from what I'm aware of, your master's thesis yes. delves into that, right? That's right. Now, was, I don't know if we'll touch it on, on that at all now, but did you understand his messi messiahship? Was, do you know what I mean? Or was it in those early days, it was all about whether or not he was God? Um, no, I understood about the messiahship, but I couldn't quite see as a scriptural 
foundation that this was a necessary part of what he did and who he was. The Messiah so, part? Um, uh, no, the deity part. The deity part, right. I mean, so then could, the deity... He could, yeah, he could die as a righteous man and God would resurrect him, but did this mean that he was also God? So that so, was a big issue. Okay, so, so if, if I'm following correctly, now that you are uh, in association with non-Jewish believers, was his <clears throat> divinity the, the a big problem to you then? Because it was it central. Was, it was central to them. Yeah, uh, it was a problem that uh, wasn't as clear as I would have liked it to be. All right. Okay. So uh, it was, let's say, um, a struggle or a, a tension between God's claiming "I am God and there is no other," and this teaching of uh, the New Testament, in particular, New Covenant. And referring back to passages that were very clear that, that stated it. So how could you reconcile these things? So I built up knowledge of the scriptures, certainly in the New Covenant and in the, the Tanakh, but uh, how to put those things together intellectually was still a problem. So I would always kind of, you know, okay, here are the passages. But I don't quite understand how this all fits together. Yeah, so it would be great to to pursue that further. But it, can we go back to how did your family react, respond to your faith? Explosion. <laughs> so uh, within uh, probably several weeks, I, I felt that I had to be uh, immersed in water. Uh, tevila in the Jewish context, but baptism in uh, Gentile terms. So uh, it was part of obeying the Lord. So I knew that I need to do this, and I didn't want to do it secretly. So I decided I'm going to tell my family what's happened. And of course, it was boom. You know, it was a, a big uh, shock to my family, of course. And uh, my father was very upset. And uh, so when I announced it's going to happen in, uh, you know, a week or so, uh, he called all the relatives who wanted to come, especially my brother-in-law. And, you know, I'm getting called all kinds of names and whatnot. My father's saying, well, you don't become a Catholic. Don't go off as a, you know, missionary to Africa or whatever. So it was a, it was a big crisis. <clears throat> so you were getting you and, were getting all this pressure from various family members. Yeah, and later on, you know, I have an appointment with the rabbi, and the rabbi is you know doing all these kinds of stories. Your dad, uh, you know. Did your dad set that up? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, my wife had a similar experience. Yeah, uh, my mother my mother called a rabbi. I won't go down that path, but she yeah, did yeah. set up an appointment. Yeah. So um, you know. When I'm talking about a new heart, he says, no, no, that's all Christian garbage, you know. So, you know, new heart and new spirit, I will give you a new covenant. So that was all, you know. Yeah, so was, you're actually referring to Old, old the Testament references. Reaction. Old yeah. Testament references, and he's calling them. Yeah. Christian garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, um, so getting back, um, my father... Uh, came to uh, my immersion in this uh, congregation. And of course, I can still picture him glaring there in the middle of the congregation as Why? I'm getting baptized Why by, this Jewish, by this Jewish believer. Okay, so Jewish believer actually immersed you. I don't know if it was clear when you said the Hebrew term was tevilah. It's another yeah. thing we could talk about uh, some other time because it's actually a Jewish thing. Most That's Christians right. don't understand how how yeah. Jewish Tavila yeah. immersion really is. But why did your dad actually show up? I don't know. I really don't know because he was certainly he... wasn't. He was not a happy camper. I can tell you that. <laughs> was he the only of your relatives that did come? Yes. But he was there. He was there. Okay, I'm just digesting that. Yes. And then what happened? Well, uh, 
I became an active part of this uh, Jewish Bible study, campus activities, congregation, teaching even uh, younger kids, juniors, uh, Bible and whatnot. So they got me involved quite a bit. So, uh, yeah. And your family, how did, as the months, the years went by, did it change at all, their relationship to all, you and all this? Uh, I suppose as typical Jewish parents, you know, they figured, you know, he'll outgrow it and, you know, grow up, but it didn't happen. So I guess they somehow accepted it uh, that, uh, you know, I was still their son. I wasn't, you know, cut off totally, but, uh, you know, it was something that they were not uh, you know, in agreement with. And then, okay, so you're still you're still in university at this time you're you eventually get your degree yeah so the year before that uh, well over a few years nahama came to montreal uh, just a few months after i received the lord and there was another jewish believer in montreal uh, that she was actually dating uh, his mother was there he was in toronto in montreal as well so uh <clears throat> he introduced Nahama to <clears throat> a few new Jewish believers. <clears throat> <Excuse> me. <clears throat> and so uh, I was at that point still in an extreme state of emotional shock, uh, having, you know, accepted the Lord. <clears throat> and so they would ask me all kinds of questions and I would say yes or no. And that was about it. Couldn't get a word out of me edgewise. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, she tells the story. Well, he's a nice guy, but, you know, awful quiet. <laughs> so so I, I've been an introvert, of course, most of my life, but uh, I still am. Uh, but, uh, of course, that was a, <clears throat> an extreme case uh, of uh, total emotional shock. So um, anyway, after 67, uh, uh, she was working in Montreal with uh, various organizations and uh, <clears throat> we got to be in the same Bible study group. And uh, so a year before I graduated, <clears throat> things got kind of more serious. And uh, that summer, uh, we decided to get married. And, and so uh, I had to finish my last year with uh, being married, finishing big project for, you know, and then also being involved in the campus group. So it was a very, very busy year. Do we ever get Probably to find out? Whatever yeah, happened, probably should have waited to get married the next year. But that's Did the we way get it to is. find out what happened to the guy she was dating. Uh, she eventually uh, stopped dating him. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and did he live to tell the tale? Uh, he lived to tell the tale, and he married another girl in in Toronto. Yeah, every blessing upon <laughs> them. Um, yeah. And so you may, uh, you may know him, but I won't share his name. That's all right. There's a there's probably a few names you could have mentioned along the way. Um, one of the dangers also of, of your, I think the third or fourth Montrealer I've had on in the past year, it's just so easy to start to talk about Montreal landmarks and things. And yeah. we've been pretty good with that as well. And, uh, not getting into it. I know some of you Montrealers out there might miss it, but let's press on. Um, so I, I do want to draw this to a, a bit of a close, but, um, somewhere, uh, you get drawn to Israel and you've been there for many, many years. Do you want to briefly share how that sure. came to be and a little bit about what you've been doing? Well, after uh, uh, I graduated, I uh, was thinking about possibly going to Israel for the sake of learning Hebrew. So we were involved in various activities in, around Montreal. And uh, the idea was that uh, we might actually start a Messianic Jewish fellowship in the Cote St. Luke area. But uh, <clears throat> my level of Hebrew was very rudimentary. And so I figured, uh, since Nakama didn't have the patience to teach me Hebrew, uh, that uh, I'd probably need to spend about a year in Israel to really get a basis in it in order to, you know, properly uh, read the scriptures. And uh, whoops, what did I do here? Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you are. To Welcome properly back. read the scripture and uh, teach from it as well, especially the Hebrew scripture. So uh, that was the plan. 
Uh, it didn't work out at that point for various reasons. So I started working in architecture in Montreal. And uh, it wasn't until uh, at the end of a large project in 1977, uh, so this is about uh, uh, seven years after I graduated, that uh, we finally saw a window of opportunity. And uh, so we already had two little boys with us. Uh, and uh, we made a kind of a sabbatical trip to Mon to, from Montreal to uh, Israel. And uh, so it was that while we were there, while I was thinking of learning Hebrew and then going back to Montreal to really do other things that we felt that God spoke to us both individually, that we are not to actually base ourselves in Montreal or Canada, but uh, to think of... Uh, living in Israel as a, a real option. Of course, uh, in those days, my wealthy uncle said, Israel, it's not a place for a Jew to make any money. You know? So that was the pretty typical thing. It was, you know, you want to waste your life, you go there, but not, not to be serious about it. So that was the kind of general attitude that the Jewish population that I grew up with. But it then eventually becomes long term. Yeah. So uh, we basically, after about a year in Israel, uh, where I'm learning Hebrew, uh, uh, paying my own way, of course, from savings that we had, uh, we figured that I need to get back and we need to uh, pack up our stuff, which was in storage. So, uh, and then uh, make our plans to get back to Israel. So it was about. Uh, a year and a few months later that we actually immigrated to Israel as a family. Of course, Nacham is Israeli, and I, we came as a family of immigrants. So in 1979, we, we settled pretty much here. And if, could you, is there a way to sum up what it's meant to you to be in Israel all these years and, and, and what your, what's on your heart um, for the country? Well, we've been now about 26 years in all with a break in the middle uh, where we did further studies. That was when we came back uh, for health reasons. Nahama wasn't doing well, so we came back for several years. And then uh, I pursued uh, these advanced degrees in philosophy. But uh, uh, we were very active in beginning uh, kind of uh, messianic activities, whether it was teaching, raising up uh, young people, uh, and uh, starting uh, new congregations. So a lot of young Israelis were coming to Lord and others that were Jewish from America and elsewhere were coming into the land and some saved, a lot of them being saved. And uh, so we were involved in very uh, uh, challenging activities and uh, exciting times where uh, we saw the body grow leaps and bounds over the approximately 13 and a half years we're actually here uh, in the land uh, at the beginning from uh, 77, including 77, all the way through uh, 92 when we left the period. So, uh, and having come back since then, we've been more involved with uh, developing material that would help uh, Jewish young people in uh, the challenges of both understanding the Hebrew scriptures, the messianic uh, mission of Yeshua, his deity, and also, of course, uh, the scientific worldview that most people have, even in Israel, which is highly secular. So uh, there's those two er elements of uh, Jewish background and secular uh, teaching that uh, we address in, um, you know, teaching young people and preparing material for them as well. I should look up what it means, you know, what, what goes around comes around, whatever that actually means, but it sounds like uh, you've been able to take the things that you struggled with all the way back to when you were a teenager. Yeah. And you've been on this journey, and now you're sharing all that you've mined and all that you've been taught by the Lord with 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 young people. It's fantastic. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's our role, and especially now that I'm a grandfather and, you know, uh, don't have the uh, strength that I used to have. Uh, I need to transfer as much as I possibly can to the next generation. So uh, whatever I've achieved is thanks to God. And uh, so it's uh, something that uh, needs to be developed in young people's lives. So they have to make it their own. It can't be just somebody else's material. Uh, so they need to see it themselves as we go through scripture and study together. And so there's various venues that, that we're involved in to do that. That's excellent. Well, just before we go, did you ever get to meet the radio pastor? Uh, yes, I did uh, meet him uh, and, and his brother, of course. Uh, but uh, he eventually, I think, retired or left uh, not long after. And because we were in Israel, there wasn't that much of an opportunity. But we have a mutual friend, Avner Bosky, that uh, did attend uh, his congregation for a number of years. So, uh, we had uh, early relationships with the Avner as well. So. Yeah. It's, you know, another example of how we do that we do the things we do and we never know how people are going to be impacted so it's yeah. uh wonderful that the the blessing that that had in your life but more than that to see how god so wonderfully miraculously worked in your life as you were struggling on your own to to find the truth and uh i i recently wrote a, a little thing for my 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 blog torah bites that I called full disclosure and how God delights in disclosing himself to, to people and that he's not hidden away. And uh, obviously you sought him and he made himself known to you. And so yeah. we, are, we are all grateful for that. And um, I'm grateful for this time you've been willing to, to share with me to do this. And if anybody wants to uh, get in touch with Alan, um, he's asked that you contact me and I'll pass on your request to him. So you could uh, um, ask me anything you want and get in touch with Alan by emailing comments at thinkingbiblically.org. And so Alan, again, thank you so much for doing this with me today. My pleasure. And uh Hopefully we'll be able to do something else in the future. That would be great. And so again, if you have any comments, questions for me or the other Alan, uh, email me at comments and thinkingbiblically.org. Uh, remember to subscribe, review, and share. And until next time, this is Alan Gilman with Thinking Biblically. Mm -hmm.